Hello and welcome back to the special edition of Bet Racing Nation. Julie, before the break, we promised the viewers that we would uh, talk about the, the pinnacle of the National Hunt calendar, mm. of course, Cheltenham. Your dad bought a pitch at Cheltenham round about 98, 99. Tell us how, how that came about. What used to happen, Catherine, is that it was... <laughs> a really horrible name, but it was Dead Man's Shoes. Someone had to pass away and then everyone moved up um, a pecking order. Mm -hmm. And you went on a waiting list. So I think at the point where my dad um, was able to buy a pitch and everything changed, he was something like 144th. So realistically, <laughs> he was never going to have a pitch at Cheltenham. But then there was a reform and what it meant is that the bootmakers came to own the pitches and therefore could sell the pitches and there was an auction held um, only weeks after my dad had had a triple heart bypass and I remember his friend Mark Hershaw um, saying you know come on we'll go down and my dad was desperate to go down and the both of them went away and you know bid for number two pitch at Cheltenham and I all I could think was why, if you've just been through a heart <laughs> bypass, would you <laughs> go and put yourself into the biggest betting arena to cause more strain to your heart? And I remember as a daughter yeah, at that yes. moment just thinking, this is awful. Why, why are you doing this? And then obviously um, it was the best thing he ever did. The amount of excitement he got from it. He loved that place. It was, you know, like it was his holy grail, you know, and, and he lived, you know, what, what you learn to realise is when he started out working, he worked in a factory and everyone lived for things like Cheltenham. Yeah. You know, the daily grind of the day to day job. This was aspirational stuff. And, and, and you know, for my dad to actually get a pitch there for him was something quite unbelievable something he never thought at the age of 14 could ever possibly happen to him dream realized a dream realized absolutely talking of tell them Julie you very kindly sent me the documentary that accompanies the 2006 festival yeah um, I was watching it and I knew and I know the results uh, yeah. and, I, and I know what's coming yeah. but still as I was watching it I'm on the end of my seat going Oh my God, I know what happens. And wow. first you have Revelier, yeah, and then you have Cadoon. Now yeah. I didn't know about Cadoon at the time. It was only on the documentary that I found out about Cadoon. Yeah. Can you can you tell us what actually happened? So Mr. McManus struck a bet for Revelier to win the Juicin. Well, the bottom line is we've never denied or confirmed okay. who, who, oh. who's actually. <laughs> so so um, I'm not breaking my code Absolutely. of silence, um, although although it's been widely reported that that is, yeah. um, is who struck the bet. But let's just say it was a McManus horse. Okay. I think that yeah. would be a fair, fair comment. And um, yeah, effectively, the bet was struck. Um, one of the things I remember about 2006 is I do festivals by, by weather. That was a particularly cold one as well cold. to add yeah, to the to add to the misery it wasn't that quite was as cold as this year but it was really cold <laughs> absolutely yeah. um so obviously we all know it. I, mean, I mean it is history um but you know it came up the hill and it came over the line first so that's how bookmaking is and um, but yes it was a double a double blow um come the last race and you know there's five runners in that race i think five anyway um and golden golden green hoops going out and the popular one with us was um, was was the outsider um, Kadun, so uh, I think I do remember at the time a journalist saying, you know, he'd left, he'd put his copy in before the last race because he thought there wasn't going to be much happening in the last <laughs> race, um, and if only it had been that <laughs> that was true. But yeah, it was um, no. What, what, watching it is a fantastic documentary that you mm. sent me, but I believe it was only available in BBC Scotland. Yeah, yeah BBC Scotland showed it that year straight after the festival. Um, so that you know, and it's it's a wonderful thing for me to have actually. You yes, know, it me you know, yeah. it's a it's a lovely memory um, of not such a lovely yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, yeah. I, I yeah, I can fully understand that. Talking of Cheltenham, there must be all manner of stories that yeah. are attached to your dad and Cheltenham yeah. and the ring. Have you got any favourites that you could share with us? Oh, it's like where do you where do you even start? There are so many. Um, one one of my favourites is that. Um, this, this guy approached the joint and he, he wanted um, £20,000 on Marlborough and he wanted an SP, which was very unusual for my dad to take an SP bet, but he took it. My dad was 
currently at that time 9 to 2 and the rest of the ring were 11 to 2 and it went off and it won I think at 11 to 2. But the boy duly handed over this bag, and it was a plastic Tesco bag. So, and it went to the join, and um, of course, Malbra obliged the boy, and it won. And um, he came back, but you know, Catherine, you've been at our joint, and for viewers that maybe um, haven't ever been at a joint, it's a tiny, tiny yeah. little stand, you know, with hardly any room to move. <laughs> And suddenly we were having to count out £110,000 to give back to this boy. So it was, it was counted out and, you know, and, and off he went into the horizon. Um, we thought probably never to see him again. Only the next day we're standing, we're working and um, we're nearly getting knocked over. My dad's went a price something that um, everyone wants on and the whole joint's swaying and this boy manages to get to the front of the joint and he says, do you remember me? And my dad says, yes. Obviously, my dad's possibly anticipating, you know, some of that yeah. 110 grand that, you coming know, back. Uh, coming back. Yeah. Um, uh, and my dad says, yes, I do remember you. Um, and the boy says, yeah, well, one of your bundles was a tenor short. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not going to repeat on, on television his response to, to that. But needless to say, um, the boy went away slightly more sheepish, <laughs> sheepishly than he arrived at the And show. so he should. I mean, yeah, I think pretty much that probably would have been my response as well. I noticed at the beginning of the documentary, an excellent documentary, by the way, there was your dad's, uh, you're at Musselburgh and, yeah. and your dad's looking at the horses in the paddock yeah. and sort of, I was really intrigued, he said he, he likes to look at them himself to sort mm. of, to, to then make up the, of how, what price he's going to offer. Yeah. Is that something that you still do yourself? I don't do it so much as my dad. I, I, I definitely work more with the form, mm -hmm. although you will occasionally see me, you know, running around. If I, if I think something's a particularly hot race, I might want to just nip round to, to the paddock and have a little look and see whether I can see. Mm -hmm. But my dad, you know, he had a special talent. He, you know, it was really important to him to see whether he thought the horse was fit. Um, I, I, and, you know, I, I remember he, he learned his, his grand, his his grandfather was a coal merchant and they had a horse that pulled the cart and my dad learned about how a horse was fit from sitting on the back of the coal cart watching the horse go up the hill and when the horse had been put out for its holidays it could barely get up the hill but when um, obviously it had been going up the hill for a few weeks it could trot up the hill and my dad learned the importance of you know how fit the horse was and and what defined that fitness yeah from there's there. there's um an interesting point in, in that sort of shot when they're around the paddock and your dad makes the point that he he was looking at a horse and he said when that horse strengthens up when he gets a bit fitter mm. that's going to be a very good horse yeah yeah i would love to know which one he was like which one he was talking about oh, but I it's, wish yeah, I could remember. yeah no but it was yeah. and i thought well that's that that's a massive insight. Yeah, yeah, you know. without a doubt. Um, and, and he also used to, I don't know if you noticed in the documentary, it was rather sweet that he was talking to oh, the no, horses as they were going back. You lovely. know, the horse was a bit uptight and a bit jangly. And yeah, I, no, I, no, I, I, I dad said, oh, you'll be fine. Yeah, <laughs> it was, no, it was lovely. And, uh, you know, people watching this, if they haven't seen that documentary, really should try and get hold of oh. it because it, it is a fantastic documentary. That's and, really and, a, sweet. and a and a and a fitting tribute really oh, to your dad. That's so. incredibly sweet. Well, do you know, um, I obviously quite liked the documentary as well because I ended up marrying the producer director. So there you go. Clearly, <laughs> clearly I thought he had something to offer. <laughs> was, I know, I did know that story. And, and as the name came up at the end, I was like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. connections made. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's lovely. Um, Julie, after the break, we'll be bringing things to the present day. Don't go away. Be back with us. We'll be back soon.